Bonjour et bienvenue dans le podcast de la Guilde des scénaristes. Nous sommes ici actuellement à Paris dans les locaux de la Guilde française des scénaristes. Pour rappel, la Guilde, c'est l'unique syndicat des scénaristes en France qui regroupe plus de 380 scénaristes professionnels du cinéma et de la télévision. Attention, aujourd'hui, un numéro spécial hors série avec un invité exceptionnel puisque nous recevons le célèbre scénariste et script doctor américain Scott Myers. Dans les années 90, Scott Myers a écrit plus de 30 scénarios aussi bien pour le cinéma que la télévision et pour la plupart des grands studios hollywoodiens. En parallèle de tout ce travail d'écriture, il enseigne l'art et l'artisanat du scénario depuis une vingtaine d'années et a créé le célèbre blog de la blacklist américaine « Go into the story » dont vous avez pu lire des articles dans la Writer's Room de la Guilde des scénaristes. Hello Scott, hey. we are so delighted to have you here in the offices of the French Guild of Screenwriters. Uh, in France, your blog « Go into the story » is a great source of uh, inspiration for us. In addition to being uh, the creator of the world's most famous blog on the art and craft of screenwriting, you are, above all, a real screenwriter. So my first question is, when and how did you start your writing career? Well, it's a circuitous route. I, uh, I wound my way around to it. I, I was going to be an academic, a teacher, professor, PhD. Mm -hmm. um, but then I played music and said, if I don't pursue this, I'll regret it. So I played music for a year, but then that turned into seven years. And then I did stand-up comedy, yeah. com comedy, uh, for two years. And then some, along the way, I discovered screenwriting. And someone asked me to write a screenplay, and I did. And as soon as I found it, I was like, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to do. Because I've been a movie fan my whole life. Never went to film school, but I... Yeah, I always watch movies. So you learn uh, the the craft of screenwriting uh, by doing and yeah. exercise uh, yourself uh, by writing uh, some uh, yes some movies. Yes, yeah. I, I didn't go to film school, but mm -hmm. I think that a large part of what people know about storytelling comes from just listening to, watching, and 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 writing mm -hmm. stories. And so that's what I did. I, I, my third screenplay was a screenplay called Canine. Yeah. Um, which in France it's Chien de Flic, which is p p police dog, cop dog, or something like that. Yeah. In, yeah, yeah, la, yeah, yeah, yeah. Chien de Flic. In, in, in Germany, it's Mein Partner mit der kalten Schnauze, ah, which means my partner with the cold nose. Ah, okay. Because <laughs> dogs have cold noses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, yeah, K9, that sold to Universal Pictures, mm -hmm. and it was produced and released in 1989, and then there were two sequels after mm -hmm. that, and that's where I got started. And so I have been a member of the Guild, Writers Guild, since 1989, and have written over 30 commission projects, feature films, one-hour TV pilots, half-hour TV. I've had four movies made. I've, uh, you know, so yeah, but I, but I learned by doing and what I did was I just watched every movie, I broke them down, I analyzed them scene by scene, I read every script I could get. Nowadays, you can get scripts PDFs online, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Back when I broke in, you had to like contact your screenwriting friends and you'd swap your scripts out and print them, get them Xeroxed and then bring them back. <laughs> so it was really quite a process. But yeah, watch movies, read scripts, write pages. That's my mantra, you know, and uh, that's how I learned how to do it. All right. So in addition of being an experienced uh, screenwriter, you have been teaching film writing for a long time. In France, uh, some people think that screenwriting cannot be learned uh, because creating stories is at first an artistic process. Uh, what is your opinion of, uh, on this subject of learning the art and craft of screenwriting? Is it possible to learn the art of screenwriting or is it something that you have in you? I think it's both. I think there is an art to it on the side of the, the writer getting in touch with their own voice and getting in touch with the characters who emerge in their stories. But if you talk to any Hollywood screenwriter, they'll absolutely say it's a craft. And you treat it like a job. And there are things you have to learn. Um, there are aspects of the craft that are learnable. Um, and for example, structure, story structure. 
Mm-hmm. William Goldman said, screenplays are structure. Yeah. At the end of the day, no matter what artistic instinct and inspiration we bring to our writing, mm-hmm. it becomes a blueprint to make a movie. And so there's a translation process that happens between your original inspiration for something, if it's an original project, and that's artistic, coming up with those characters and coming up with those story ideas Mm -hmm. and sitting with those characters and immersing yourself in their lives and working with them so that the story emerges from that work. That's artistic. But then once you start to really work the story and get that structure into place, that's more craft. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's both. It is often said, write what you know. Uh, what do you think about, uh, about this idea? Is it a good idea to write what you know, what is in, what's, it's in you, or uh, is it something that can limit your creativity? That's a good question. Uh, I would say I would rather tell people, write what you know emotionally. Because you, what stories you may know may be very small. And sometimes small stories are fine, Mm. but it it depends upon what type of writer you want to be and what environment you want to write in. If you want to work in Hollywood, you have to be mindful of commercial sensibilities and finding an audience. And so, for example, I'm a big fan of Pixar. Mm -hmm. And Pixar, I think, they write about stuff that they don't know, like a rat who is a a chef, (laughs) a fish who loses a son, Uh, robots, you know, they will they will explore realms and stories that they don't know, but what they do know is the emotional stuff that's going on. You know, Marlon loses his son Nemo. Any parent can relate to the to the fear of losing a child, mm-hmm. and so they look for those universal themes. So I would say, unless you've lived a really fascinating life <laughs> and have some really interesting story that can emerge from that that would lend themselves to being a movie then write more about what you know emotionally find stories that are bigger that can sustain a film 100 minutes and write from an emotional place I I believe that people when they go to movies and even TV they want emotional entertainment they want to be entertained but they want to feel something Mm. do you know when J.J. Abrams when he took over Star Wars and did Star Wars 7, and so rebooting the whole franchise, he got everybody in a room. The very first thing he did was, he got everybody in a room and he wrote up on a whiteboard, what do we want the audience to feel when they walk out of the theater? And that's the, I think that says something. You know, We really do need to be dialed into like what's going on emotionally in our storytelling. What do you think about uh, the writer's block? Do you think it's a myth or is it a reality? If it's a reality, What's, uh, uh, what can we do? I think it's entirely possible for people to get caught up in themselves, in their minds. There are what I call these voices of negativity, which are very crafty, and they can get you caught in a loop. What is it? Uh, a paralysis through analysis, you know, thinking too much about things. So the best thing to do is just to write every day and don't expect to write perfection. That's probably the most advantageous aspect of screenwriting as opposed to say maybe novel writing or poetry, um, which is that you know it's going to be imperfect when you write a draft. It's an, what they call it, we call it an iterative process. You have to write it and rewrite it and rewrite it and rewrite it. Hmm. And so while that may kind of seem debilitating like oh i'm going to write this and it's not going to be perfect if you flip your perspective to the side just a little bit you go oh wait a minute it's not going to be perfect that means the pressure is off that means what i write today doesn't have to be perfect so i think writer's block oftentimes is really a a part of that voices of negativity that feeds on our perfectionism Mm -hmm. and our procrastination um I don't believe that it really exists. It's more of a mental state. Mm. And I would just encourage people to write every day. And no matter what. No matter uh, what. Yeah. Even if it's... Do not disconnect with the... Don't. Uh, okay. Keep, keep, keep it going. going. Mm-hmm. And you know, we can rewrite. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, a big part of it, too, is the characters. You know, I think if you believe that they exist, and, mm-hmm. and writers have that kind of weird... 
magical thing where we do believe our characters exist. If you're stuck, lean on them. Go spend time with them. Write a free write a scene with them doing something, or mm. imagine a situation where you're interviewing them, because it's really their story. And so that's another way around, you know, supposed writer block. I have a very uh, simple question: What is a good screenplay? <laughs> uh, does it exist, or are they just different type of uh, of stories? Oh, I think there are absolutely good screenplays. I mean, you know, in, in Hollywood, one of the supreme compliments you can get as a writer if someone says, that was a good read. That was a good read. And what they mean by that, mean by that is it worked on all levels. It was great characters, good song, strong story concept, well executed. The scene description was tight but visual and emotionally entertaining. The scene lengths were appropriate and just moved along there was a good narrative drive so those are all things you can work on as part of the craft and i absolutely believe there's good screenplays you know why because i've read them like if you read michael clayton uh mm. that script is phenomenal um by the, uh, tony gilroy tony gilroy yeah um i've you know I've, there's so many 500 days of summer yeah by you know uh michael weber and, and scott neustadter great script little miss sunshine by Mike mm -hmm. Arndt, great script. I mean, there are just some really wonderful scripts. So yes, absolutely, and that's another thing I would recommend. Read those good scripts and break them down and see why they work. But when you read uh, scripts, when do you say to yourself, oh, this is a good, uh, there is a good idea of a movie here? When, uh, how do you say that? How, uh, how do you figure it out? The, if it's a good enough idea for being a, a yeah. movie? When, uh, when you read the script, yeah. yeah. Well, actually, that's the, the, I'd say the most important time to raise that question is for the writer when they're trying to determine what to write. And there are certain questions you can ask. ask. You can say, for example, um, who's the audience for this movie? Uh, what's the hook? Is there something that, uh, you know, in this society, there's so much media thrown at people. What is it going to be that, that single element or those single few elements in the story concept that are going to grab their attention? And so that's something, a strong story concept. Um, the most important thing is, are you emotionally invested in the story? Because you've got to have that passion to write it. But uh, when you're reading a script, I don't know. I mean, it's like when I read a script and... and uh, it's a really good script. It's going to have all those things. It's going to check all those boxes. There are some scripts you read and the, the concept's excellent. The execution's not so good. Yeah. Um, but, you know, ideally you hit everything. You, you know, you, you do it all. But a strong story concept is huge. It's really important. In France, unlike the United States, uh, the genre, genre. Film, uh, movies are uh, very underdeveloped. And in, uh, in the U.S., uh, we can see a lot of movies about, uh, you know, uh, science fiction, uh, thrillers, uh, fantasy uh, movies. Um, do you know why uh, it is so popular in the U.S. and not in France? Well, I, could, I think there's a culture of that in the United States. I mean, I mean it's, it's popular in France, those uh, genre movies, but we are not um, producing not those producing. kinds of, of, of movies. And do you know? Do you know why? Do you know why it's so difficult uh, in France? In France, producing mostly like dramas. Yeah, drama, uh, uh, author uh, movies, or yeah, mo Actually, most of it. Drama and, and above all, comedy. Comedy, comedy and drama. Com uh, in the U.S., the most uh, profitable movies are uh, genre films, mm -hmm. uh, science fiction, etc. Superhero uh, movies, yeah. but in uh, in France, it's uh, above all comedy, comedy movies. Okay. Um, well, I think that, you know, there is a, in Hollywood, they have a phrase called elevated genre, which is like genres with, genre movies with really good characters. But generally speaking, genre movies, I think, have kind of a um, less of a, there's less of a, not appreciation, less of a, sense of them being like of value you know creatively action mm, yeah. thriller um, horror mm. right and yet we see great movies like get out was fantastic yeah. you know so uh 
there, there's just a long time culture in the United States where of these people loving horror movies and action movies and thriller movies and playing around with those tropes and reinventing them and reinvestigating them. So that's part of it. There's just there are horror fans are huge. They're very dedicated. Uh, you know, they love horror movies, and so and horror movies tend to be less expensive to produce. Mm-hmm. And so then that means that the studios are more inclined to make those minor movies because they know there's a built-in audience. And for example, I know uh, Scott Beck and Brian Woods who wrote A Quiet Place. I don't know mm-hmm. if A Quiet Place came to France, but... Yeah, uh, it's uh, Sans un bruit. Yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. You know, you make a noise, you die, Yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and the movie was made for $17 million as a production budget. And it's done $350 million worldwide. And so, again... Uh, but that was a really smart story concept. So I, I don't know why France, I guess maybe France is just more cultured and smarter, frankly. And, you know, I think the, you know, cinema here more mm-hmm. than than movie, you know, like the United States. Like we like popcorn movies, we call them, you know, where we sit and yeah. kind of in, you know, enjoy, enjoy it, lowbrow mm-hmm. kind of thing. But um, I, I would imagine that's probably part of it, you know. Uh, you said that William Goldman uh, uh, said uh, screenplays are structure, always a structure. But uh, can you tell us what is structure in the in a screenplay? Well, this goes back. You know, I think you, if you if you can't go too far away from Aristotle, beginning, middle, and end. You know, three act structure. I don't think you can go very far away from uh, the hero's journey. You know, mm-hmm. a character goes on a journey, uh, enters into a new, new life experience, and they come back a transformed individual. Separation, initiation, return, three acts. Um, and then, uh, so that's, that's the structure, really. I mean, now there's all sorts of iterations on it, and there's all sorts of variations on it. Uh, but those, those three acts, uh, I think you can divide that middle into two and look at it from a psychological standpoint where, for example... Most protagonist characters in movies start off in a state of what I call disunity, where they're not living an authentic life, that they have to go on this journey in order to find something about themselves that is lying dormant. And so if they're a disunity state at the beginning, if it's a positive arc, they end up in a state of unity. Well, they don't just jump there. they got to go through a process. And so the middle of the story, Act Mm 2, you can divide that into Act 2A and Act 2B. And Act 2A is generally where the protagonist is going through these experiences and they're deconstructing their old ways of being. They're being forced out of their old ways of being, which they're experiencing typically as a negative. But what it's doing is it's shaking them up. It's breaking up their patterns of belief and behaviors. And it's allowing that need, that underlying thing that's inside them to bubble up into their consciousness. This is what Jung talks about this. Become who you are. It's already there. Campbell talks about this. The hero's journey is not a journey of attainment, but reattainment. It's like Glenda the Good Witch says to Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, you had the power to go home all along. You just had to go and discover it. Well, that's, that's the journey of the protagonist. So that deconstruction process in the first half of Act Two is breaking up their old ways of being. And it's allowing that thing that needs to emerge, it's in their psyche already, to come out. The second half of Act Two, generally speaking, is reconstruction. So now that this stuff has come out, they can embrace it and start to evolve toward their new self, their authentic self. So I think that there's a way you can look at the psychological flow of the story, disunity, deconstruction, reconstruction, unity, and that can inform actually the way that you structure the plot and look at all the other characters. Uh, the protagonist journey. So I'm writing a book on that, in fact, called The Protagonist Journey, um, character-driven screenwriting and storytelling. Uh, in France, some people think that uh, dialogue uh, are more important than structure. What do you think about that? Yeah, no, a lot of, don't a lot of credits have scenario and dialogue separated for the writers? Sometimes, yeah, yeah in France, uh, there are, uh, there's uh, the, the guy who wrote, uh, who writes the dialogue, and, and uh, sometimes there is no, another person that writes Uh, what we call the, the scenario, scenario. The, the, the screenplay. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's interesting. Now, I'll, I'll tell you that, because being a member of the Writers Guild, we have a credit arbitration process, and we control that like 
if there's a dispute about who gets writing credit. And there are these four areas that you look at when you're comparing scripts. And I gotta be honest with you, dialogue is the least important in terms of determining who writes, who gets credit. You've had, there have been cases where people have gotten really upset because they didn't get credit, where they've said, I rewrote every line of dialogue. But that's not the most important thing in most scripts. Most mm. scripts, the most important thing are the characters, the structure, sequences, scenes. And so it's interesting to hear that here there may be people who say, no, dialogue is the most important thing. Because what's ironic to me is that movies are primarily a visual medium. You know, A Quiet Place is a perfect example. There was hardly any dialogue uh, yeah. in A Quiet Place. <laughs> And the movie's done $350 million. Uh, it, it's maybe because in France we do a, a lot of comedies and uh, maybe comedies um, yeah. uh, uh, rely on uh, dialogue most of the time. And that's why maybe we, uh, we often say that. It depends upon what type of story it is, right? Now, like comedy. Mm. So uh, slapstick comedy, physical, broad comedy, physical comedy maybe rely less on dialogue. Of course. On the other hand, you may have a comedy like When Harry Met Sally, nor mm. Efron, which is like all dialogue, right? All so, the Woody Allen movies. Or Woody Allen movie, all dialogue, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, I think it's not, it's not one or the other, you know? But I do, I tell my students all the time, movies are primarily a visual medium, you know? It, they, they existed for 30 years. Here in France, Lumiere and... You know, all the, the birthplace in, in many respects for, for cinema. For 30 years before dialogue ever came into existence in 1927, you know, with the jazz singer. Uh, it was all visual storytelling. And I think that in many ways, because the international market is so big, I think I've read where 75% of box office revenues now are generated from countries outside of Canada and the United States. And t dialogue may not be translatable as well, comedy especially. Mm. There's actually a conventional wisdom in Hollywood that comedy doesn't travel as well overseas. Uh, and a lot of that is just maybe the, the jargon, the references in dialogue may not play in Albania or India or Japan oh, yeah. where they play in Chicago or Los Angeles. So I think, look, dialogue is great, but, uh, you know, Story structure, visual storytelling, I think, are, it's, uh, they are right up there. And uh, we're, we are talking about dialogue, but what is a good dialogue for you? Well, dialogue is not conversation. Dialogue is conversation with a purpose. Every line has got to be revealing character or moving the plot forward or revealing something. So... Um, And do, do you think in, um, in uh, for example, in the Tarantino's movies, dialogue are good, or uh, sometimes they are losing <laughs> tracks of the of the structure of the plot, or you know? Well, that's a great question because as soon as I say, well, it's not conversation; it's conversation with a purpose. Then you look at the the first six minutes of Reservoir Dogs, or <laughs> yeah. you know, those conversations in Pulp Fiction where they're talking about the you know, uh, sucking on a, a girl's t uh, toe or whatever, you know. Uh, Yeah, I, there are certain wordsmiths, you know, certain dialogue writers where you just say, go with it. Paddy Chayefsky, you know, from Network. But if you look at Paddy Chayefsky, you know, he was a playwright originally. Any of those long monologues that he wrote in Network, those were all servicing the plot. You know, it wasn't like it was just verbiage. So uh, I would say good dialogue to me. I'm, you know, I'm not a, I'm not as great a dialogue writer as I am. I think about writing character and action, but I always look for like, okay, is this unique? Is distinctive? Is it reflective of characters? Does it accomplish what I need to do? Um, I'm always cutting lines. You know, this is something, by the way, um, that I think you, you you experience if you get in front of a camera, or get on set where you write all this stuff down, and particularly dialogue, and you find that once the actors get a hold of it, that, that those lines just can be cut. Because you know? yeah. they do yeah. things with their eyes, they do things with their bodies, you just don't need the line. The, the, the less dialogue is better. Uh, the less you have dialogue and more in... It depends upon the genre, but that's what I tell my students. I'm always, you know... Clint Eastwood was famous for this, you know, when he did all his movies with the red, he'd redline his dialogue, he'd cut out half his dialogue. 
Okay. You know, less is more. But That's but great. every writer is different, you know, and Tarantino and those guys, I mean, he's brilliant, you know, and his dialogue is amazing. So if you can do that, great. <laughs> <laughs> What is the more important for you, the plot or the character? <clears throat> Absolutely character, because character is plot. So, you know, I think that it's incumbent on people, writers, to focus on character first. That's one of the issues I have with a lot of the culture that's grown up around the screenwriting gurus, you know, the gurus they call them, where people tend to take from that, not necessarily blaming the gurus, but blaming this instinct to want to reduce screenplay, screenwriting to formula. You know, break into act two and 25 or have this happen on this page or, the, you know, if you have that top down writing, that outside in writing, you're going to be less effective at coming up with authentic characters, multidimensional characters, interesting uh, situations. I believe that if you start with character, end with character, you'll find the story in between that process. You engage the characters. Again, it's their story. They're the ones living it. And so if you do these direct engagement exercises, these what I call character sit downs, where it's almost like a meditative state, where you close the doors, you shut the windows, you turn off your phone, you imagine you're in the mind of that character or they're in your mind. It's like Star Trek, a Vulcan mind meld where you're trying to get in sync with them. You close your eyes, you put your fingers on the keyboard and for 15 minutes you just type. You just type and you keep trying to think, what are, what are they thinking? What are they feeling? What are their words? And you blind type and 80% of what you end up with may be nonsense, but 20% of it could be gold. And so you do that over and over again to those ca characters and then they become more alive and more active in your, in your creative process, the plot emerges from that. There are key questions you can ask of a protagonist related to their disunity state at the beginning that are suggestive of where the plot goes. Just from that, just literally starting with some of these fundamental questions. So I think character is absolutely more important. And how do you find a, a great, a good a fictional character? Well, that's, that's a challenge, isn't it? Um, listen to people around you, watch people. Uh, I do a thing on my blog every April called the story idea each day for a month. So all during the year, you know, like every consumer, I'm watching and listening to things, but I have one of my antenna up like, ah, that may be an interesting story. And so I'll flag it and, and store it in my computer. Mm. And then I come back in April and every day I pull one out and say, okay, here's this little thing, this little snippet that I had, uh, that I found. What could we do with that? Is this a comedy? Is this horror? Is this thriller? But the things that interest me are those interesting characters, are those people who uh, jump out at you. Like I heard one, if you got time for, I'm going to tell you a little story, okay? Two minute story. This is an amazing story. So this white woman in South Carolina, which was the first state to secede during the Civil War. So it's got a history, right? She relocated, I think for economic reasons, to a neighborhood that was predominantly black, African-American. She put up two flagpoles in her front yard, one with the American flag, one with the Confederate flag. The black families came to her and said, you know that that is offensive to us. Mm. She said, I'm doing this to honor my, my, my ancestors who fought in the Civil War, so I don't see it that way. So it became this contentious thing. They built the fence up higher, she built the flagpoles up higher, right? So you think this is gonna get really bad. She has a heart attack. She goes into the hospital. Who comes to see her in the hospital? The black families. Mm -hmm. She comes home, she can't cook. Who brings her food? The black families. You know what she does? She takes down the Confederate flag and she says, I would rather honor the people that are living Than the people that are dead. And she now is a member of that black church. Now that's a great story. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And that's something I just saw in the newspaper. And it's a great character. It's like fish out of water, white woman. Yeah. Water. yeah. So great confrontation and yeah, uh, conflict and the arc, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, so I think what makes a great character is something that you that you connect with emotionally. You look at a character and go, wow, I just really feel something powerful going on there. And if you, can, if you can tap into that, then that's great because that passion is what's going to carry you through the process. 
Um, it is often said that writing is rewriting. Uh, what do you think about that? It's true. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't. I don't. I suppose there are people who write a perfect first draft. If you want to be a screenwriter, this is absolutely true. You know, you, you write a script and it's it, it they say it's green lit. Oh great, we're gonna make this movie, and then they get they get actors attached to it, or they get actors attached to it and then green light it. Then then the actors people are gonna say, Oh, we want you to do this, that, and the other. So then you have to rewrite that. Then a location falls out. Mm. And they say, well, we can't, we can't do the scene here. We have to do it over here. So you got to rewrite that. Or the director says, uh, I don't want to do this scene. Or I want this subplot. We don't have time for the subplot. So now you got to rewrite the entire story getting rid of that subplot. You're constantly rewriting. Till the, the beginning of the shooting? Or till beginning, the through shooting, mm -hmm. but way before. They call it, you know, there's... We jokingly call the development process in Hollywood development hell. <laughs> yeah, know, yeah. There's so many notes and rewriting. But you hope for, you'll find, be working with really talented people on the other side, and they, they'll be making suggestions that make the script better. But yeah, you absolutely have to be willing to rewrite. On your blog, Go Into The Story, you often compare music and writing. Why? Well, this probably is why I resonated so much with screenwriting because I was a songwriter. Mm. And songs are very structured. Verse, refrain, verse, refrain, bridge, refrain. Or, you know, there's some variations on that. Mm -hmm. But there's a protagonist typically in the story. Uh, oftentimes there's a change that happens. There's a beginning, middle, and an end. There's a, there's a um, value in brevity and writing, strong vivid words um, and so I think that there's there's some there's a connectivity there music's you know songs are stories um, but beyond that I just think that like for example uh, I studied classical music in college and there was a form of music that was dominated classical music for 200 years called sonata form and sonata form is three movements exposition development recapitulation And I've done blog posts on this. That's three-act structure. Exposition. The first act, that's where we largely provide the information, introduce the characters, and, and, and set up the story and what the central conflict is. Development. That's where everything develops now. We set loose this, all this stuff and throw all these balls in the air and, and see how the subplots interweave and, and, and the various characters uh, affect each other. And then recapitulation is an act three is where we've seen everything that's going on now how does it magnify itself how does it play out to its resolution at the end so i think that there is a lot of uh, connection of music i can tell you also this i know a lot of writers who are really into music and i know a lot of writers who will actually when they're writing a project will create a mixtape for themselves That's like, this is the mixtape for this project. And they'll listen for to those songs. Inspiration. For, for inspiration. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I can't, I've interviewed. To get in the mood of, the, of what you write. This, you is, this is the atmosphere. This is the tone. This mm. is the feel of this project. And I'm going to listen to these songs over and over again to, to, to sustain and feed myself. In, uh, in your articles, you talk about the importance of writing style in uh, contemporary scripts. Why is this so important to you? Because writing style is constantly changing. This is why people need to read screenplays. And you can read the great ones, you know, like The Apartment from 1960 by Billy Wilder and Izzy Diamond. That's a great script. But stylistically different than where we are now. Uh, it's, it's constantly evolving. It's a long thing. I won't get into it. But where we are now is leaner, spare, scene description, shorter paragraphs, three lines maybe, um, using each paragraph to suggest a camera shot, not use camera jargon or directing lingo, but that we get in the reader used to that this paragraph is a camera shot, this paragraph is a camera shot, this paragraph. Is... And so readers get used to this spare, lean style. Not to say you can't write a script where you've got eight or ten line scene uh, paragraphs, of, uh, eight or ten lines per paragraph of scene description, but that style... That's part of a good read. 
I guarantee you that when a script reader says it was a good read, they mean it was easy to read, that it really flowed, that it had, had a nice flow to it, and, and it wasn't these laborious big chunks of scene of, description. Of scene description. You know? yeah. And uh, let's come to uh, an important question for us in uh, for us French people. In France, uh, there is a cultural ideology that we call the the author theory that emerged in the in the 50s, in the late 50s. Um, that is uh, born with the new wave of the filmmakers, and uh, this ideology is still active today. Uh, since only 9% of scripts are written by individual screenwriters. They are not a group of screenwriters, individual screenwriters. Uh, this is what we call the world exception. To write in France, we need to partner with a director. What do you think of this French author's policy? Well, the auteur theory came to the United States. It was taught when I went to the University of Virginia as an undergraduate. They had two cinema classes. I took them and so I read, read all that stuff. Studied the French wave, which I loved. I thought the French new wave was awesome. Um, but uh, it's interesting that it's taken hold in the United States the way that it has. And it's a struggle from a writer's, you know, frankly, from a writer's perspective. To say that you're the author of a film and you haven't written it is just mm. seems crazy to us so now it's one thing if you're if a writer is co-writing or if a writer is intimately involved with the writer the screenwriter and they're working together for a shared vision but to say a film by and mm. you haven't written it or been involved in the writing process that's not only a, a, a smack at writers it's the entire crew so this whole idea of a film by unless you've done it all Like Soderbergh, perhaps, maybe could take a, a film by credit because he does everything. Mm -hmm. uh, I just think is is demeaning to people who work on it. That said, um, film is primarily a director's medium, and they go off and make the movie. You know, I've had directors go off and make the movie badly, and so you know, there's nothing much you can do about that. If 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 a writer really is upset about that, I'd say there's two options, one or three. One, become a novelist. <laughs> two, uh, work in TV, because TV is a writer's medium. It's not the director who's going to guarantee those eight episodes, yeah. those 10 episodes, those 22 episodes. It's the writers, the showrunners, the writer-producers are going to guarantee that. And the third thing you can do is become a writer-director. You know, nowadays, because of digital technologies, the cost is like zero in terms of going out and making something. And just, by the way, writers should be out making short films, period, because they're getting experience of seeing the difference between what they write on the page and what comes out mm. on, 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 on set. So um, it's, it is what it is. I don't think it's going to change. I mean, very much because once people have power, they're reluctant to give it up. And as I say, it is. Ultimately, the director goes out and makes the movie. So it, I, I don't see it changing anytime soon. The best you can do as a screenwriter, at least if you work in, in France, I would think is partner with really good directors who have a reputation for actually listening to and working with writers. You know, if, if, if a director is dictatorial and demeaning to the writer, you probably don't want to work with them, you know. Perhaps the best advice then is just write the best damn script possible because, it, you know, like my first agent said, if you write a great script, we'll find you. What is the image of the of French screenwriters abroad? I think you know smoking there cigarettes, <laughs> drinking cognac, staring out at the Parisian uh, skyline at three or four in the morning, pacing back and forth, you know, existential <laughs> angst. I think you know, I don't know, as if sort of having a little bit of fun, you know, more s serious minded, you know. Even though France has a great tradition of comedy. I mean, just wonderful uh, comedy films, but I do feel like there's probably a bit of that stereotyping that would go on that perceives that the French have a more serious-minded culture. Mm. Um, so it's probably not much different, frankly, than, than you know what um, American writers, we do the same thing. You know, we drink late at night and we smoke and we pace and we angst about it, you know. And, and uh, is there a good time to write? Is it the night, is it the morning for you, for example? I'm a night owl. 
so I, 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 I write at night. But I, I, I interview, you know, I interview lots of writers, and they're all different. You know, mm-hmm. writers will write and wake up at three in the morning and write. Uh, uh, you know, before they go to work, if they're if, if it's an avocation, some will write during lunch, some will write in the afternoon, uh, some will stew over a story they'll think about it for for months and then write it over a weekend you know yeah i don't think there's any one right way to write you have to get in touch with your uh, circadian cycles your own sort of way in which you uh, live your life where are you find out where you're the most vibrant and active and creative and try and find time to do your writing then in france we have a serious deficit of uh, screenplay culture Do you have any advice to help us change that? If only there were a blog that followed screenwriting that they could follow here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I would encourage you to socialize. I would encourage you to inv- invite American screenwriters of note over here. Uh, you know, uh, they travel in Europe. You know, they're on Twitter. Say, uh, you know, to, to Tony Gilroy or to... Uh, Nicole Perlman, or to Mike Arndt, uh, or to uh, you know, any of the Pixar, Pete Docter, mm. Andrew Stanton, on Twitter say, hey, we have a guild here in France, in Paris. If you're over in Paris, we'd love to have you here for an event. Mm. And the interesting thing about writers is that most writers are really happy to talk to other people about the craft. I think that writers, generally speaking, in Hollywood in particular, Uh, while some of them are irascible, they're really good people. So that would be one thing. Just bring those writers over here. Another thing would be to, uh, do you all help facilitate writers groups? Like, you know, getting together three or four writers who say, okay, every two weeks we're going to meet and we're going to exchange pages and we're going to provide feedback. Uh, that would be something that would be helpful. Um, you know, reading and write, uh, listening to interviews, uh, meeting and going to movies and then going out afterwards and breaking down the story or reading scripts that become available every November, December, and January, the studios put out scripts. You know, I know there are scripts that you can get illegally, but legally mm-hmm. you can get scripts every November, December, and January okay. and just do it like when we do it on my blog. This week we are analyzing First Reformed by Paul Schrader, which is a phenomenal mm-hmm. script. And so get the, get the writers together and say, let's look at the screenplay. This is the first iteration of the story. Let's look at that. And you can even compare it to the movie. There's a lot to be learned in that trend. Mm. So I would just say be super active and recognize that there is a great screenwriting culture. The United States, even as much problems as we have sometimes with our reputation in Hollywood and, and not being recognized, say, by the press as much as actors or directors, the, there is a... A, a very strong culture of screenwriting in the in the United States, and so there are those things that I think you can do to help. Yeah, that, that's what we feel here in France when you when we see uh, the United States. We see uh, there is a strong uh, screenplay culture over there, more than uh, in France. And many French uh, screenwriters would like to work, uh, who would like to work in um, for the United States. What? Uh, What would you recommend uh, as an advice for these uh, screenwriters who want to work in the United States? Uh, th- the marketplace is becoming so much more international now with the streaming services in particular, like Netflix, who now have offices, I believe, in Paris, London, mm-hmm. Madrid, mm-hmm. and I think in Germany. And so there is a real internationalization of storytelling going on. And... Hollywood is not stupid. They know that 75% of box office revenues, as I said earlier, come from the international market. Also, too, it's not like it used to be. Breaking into Hollywood, it used to be you either had to be the son or the daughter of a mogul, like a studio executive, or you had to graduate from one of the top film schools like NYU or USC or UCLA. Or you had to know someone who knew someone who was second cousins with someone who slept with someone who was someone in Hollywood and you could get your script down there, right? Nowadays, there are um, outfits like The Blacklist, which is the premier screenwriting uh, brand in Hollywood, where you can upload a script. I don't get paid by them. My blog is the official screenwriting blog of The Blacklist, but I, don't, I get no money out of this. So I'm not saying this for a cut of the money. I'm just saying that it's a very democratic 
uh, you know, way of, of getting your script in front of, I think they have 3,000 people in the industry on the other side. And you can mark your script. It's horror genre under $2 million with a female lead and all these different things so that they can use these uh, various parameters to filter out and look for particular projects. And they've had, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of writers who get representation. They've had, I think, 10 movies made off the blacklist. So, so there are ways to get scripts from anywhere in the world. And they've had people from outside the United States, many people from outside the United States, who've sold projects there. So that's one thing. The main thing you could do is um, define and develop your own voice. If you can come out with a unique voice and write something that is a solid script, I know for a fact the TV showrunners, I hear this all the time when I see them interviewed or talk with them, is that they're looking for writers who have a distinctive voice. And what that is is a little nebulous, you know, when you see it kind of thing, you know. Mm. But, uh, but develop your voice. And then I guess the final thing is just, you know, follow the trades and see how the business is, is, is working. And uh, not to chase the market so much, but just be cognizant that, you know, if you're going to write a 14th century uh, Norwegian language musical, that's probably not going to have much cachet in Hollywood, you know. If, on the other hand, you were going to write a romantic comedy nowadays, whereas about a year and a half ago they were thinking that it was dead. It's come back with Crazy Rich Asians, and Netflix had like four or five of them last summer, and it's been reinvigorated. So I think those are some things you can do. Uh, we have the impression that we live in a world where stories are everywhere. Uh, political ideologies, religion, extremisms. There is a lot of, uh, of talk about storytelling in the, in the media. Why has storytelling become so important in our, uh, in our globalized world? Why storytelling is everywhere? It is Even everywhere. in TV news and uh, everywhere. It is everywhere. It's absolutely everywhere. It's why we have certain presidents and leaders. Because the, the media controls the stories. And that shows you the power. You know, the reality behind certain leaders is far different than the stories that are told about them. So stories have power. Good stories can move people, can inspire people, can deceive people. And so nowadays, it's absolutely imperative that we have people who tell stories about subcultures that are not in the mainstream. That, tell, that put a human face on the other. I teach at DePaul University School of Cinematic Arts in Chicago. Half of our students are non-white. Over half of our students are people who identify with being female. And so it's a very diverse culture. And we work with those students to tell them, Let tell your story. Tell the story of your cultures. Tell the story of where you came from. I said earlier, you know, writing what you know. Well, if you write what you know and it's something that's really unique and distinctive and in a subculture that we don't know much about, mm -hmm. but they can explore that in a way that, that is very exciting and informative and compelling, that's great. We need that nowadays. There's too much xenophobia, too much misogyny. We need people who can put a human face on the other so that they become not the other, but like a brother or a sister. And so uh, stories can do that. You know, we've seen that. We've seen it, the negative with the propaganda. Well, stories can also uplift people and inspire mm -hmm. people. And uh, I just think people, people resonate with stories. I mean, when you're a kid, when you're a parent, it's like every night your kid says, tell me a story, Daddy. You know, it's like part of human culture, right? We need that. We need it, <laughs> yes. And final question. If you, have, uh, if you had one piece of advice for a young screenwriter that is uh, looking uh, to you, What will it be? Uh, one advice. Well, again, I came up with this, <laughs> this mantra some years ago. You can learn everything you need to learn about the craft by doing three things. Watch movies, write, uh, read scripts, and write pages. If you do that over and over and over again and you're serious about it, you can learn everything you need to know. You don't need to go to film school. You don't need to do... Uh, all that rigmarole. I think film school can be very valuable. It can ex accelerate the process. 
and you can come out with a portfolio of content and you work with a cohort and all that stuff. But it's absolutely critical to watch movies or TV if you if TV is your thing. Mm. Watch it. Immerse yourself in it. Break it down. Sit there and stop it scene by scene and write down. Do a scene by scene breakdown where you're looking and seeing where the key plot points are. What are the subplots? Where, are the, where did the story turn? You do that over and over again. Reading scripts is absolutely critical. There's just some things you cannot learn unless you're reading a script. And the more you do, the more you start to absorb things like pacing, when to enter scenes, when to exit scenes, what to include in a scene and what not to include in the scene, how to approach and attack scenes, how to write subtext. You start to intuit that stuff. And then the third thing is write pages. I have a, a, a thing that I came up with on the blog and it's quite popular. One, two, seven, fourteen. Read one script a week. Watch two movies a week. One of them is popcorn time. You just sit back and relax. Mm. The second one, that's when you break it down and you do that analysis. Seven, write seven pages a week. One page a day. One page. A, if you write one page a day, you spend a month prepping a story. You spend four months writing that first draft and a month rewriting it. You can write two spec scripts in a year, two spec feature scripts in a year, mm. right? And so, uh, so, and 14. 14 is 14 hours a week. Two hours a day, you're doing research, or you're rewriting a script, or you're prepping a script. So you've got one project you're writing, but there's always something else that you're, you're developing, so that you're being, once you get done with one, one draft, you just move right into the next thing. So again, watch movies or TV, read scripts, and write pages. The final note in that thing is live life. You know, <laughs> fall in love, fall out of love. Go to museums, listen to music, get drunk, have a hangover, don't do that again. You know, <laughs> go travel, uh, listen to people, uh, you know, turn on weird radio stations, whatever. Live life because the more you suck that in and the more you, you experience life, the, you can bring those experiences to your writing. Thank you very much, Scott. Et voilà, vous savez ce qu'il vous reste à faire. Lisez des scénarios, regardez des films et n'hésitez pas à, à gratter, à gratter des pages. Voilà. Allez, rendez-vous pour un prochain numéro de Secret de Scénariste. Ciao. Au revoir. Voilà, j'espère que ce hors-série spécial Scott Myers vous a intéressé. Si c'est le cas, n'hésitez pas à aller sur la chaîne YouTube de la Guilde et abonnez-vous. Vous y trouverez régulièrement des nouvelles vidéos sur tout ce qui touche au scénario en France. Et bien sûr, n'oubliez pas d'aller sur le site internet de la Guilde où vous trouverez une mine d'informations sur l'actualité des scénaristes français ainsi qu'une Writer's Room, un centre de ressources sur l'artisanat de l'écriture avec les traductions des meilleurs articles de Scott Myers. Enfin, je vous propose des critiques de films et des vidéos thématiques sur le cinéma sur ma chaîne YouTube, The Film Talker, donc n'hésitez pas à venir vous abonner sur ma chaîne. Secret de scénariste, c'est terminé, à très bientôt pour un nouveau numéro.